Yu-Gi-Oh! has always been a tabletop card game, but now has a very promising future as an eSport with the release of Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel, which is completely free to download and has greatly increased the accessibility of the game. But for a while, Yu-Gi-Oh! eSports was solely represented by the mobile game Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links, which has been featured at the World Championships since 2017 and was even supposed to make another world's appearance this year in 2022 before it was cancelled due to health and safety reasons. But before Duel Links, we had nothing. But before there was nothing, there was everything. You see, Konami was way ahead of the esports curve. All the way back in 2003, it made its first esports debut with the title Yu-Gi-Oh! Worldwide Edition Stairway to the Destined Duel, which was released on the Game Boy Advance. This was actually a slightly modified version of the game Eternal Duelist Soul, which technically speaking was the first true duel simulator that Konami had ever released. Many programming and graphical features would carry over from one game to the next, which was fairly obvious, but by modifying this game, Konami would now have the opportunity to create a version of it that, as its name suggests, be released worldwide by featuring a number of languages that the player could choose from. Most importantly, having all the copies of the game compatible with each other allowed Konami to bridge the gap between players from different regions, which was an ever-growing problem considering that the OCG and TCG divide would create many logistical issues for the company and still creates many issues for the company to this day. So along with the release of Stairway to the Destined Duel, Konami announced the very first Yu-Gi-Oh! esports event would be featured at the 2003 Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championships, which would be held in New York's Madison Square Garden on August 10th. And to qualify for this, players would need to win in local Yu-Gi-Oh! Game Boy Advance tournaments, which were held all around the world, and all the winners of these events would then meet at the World Championships to determine the true Yu-Gi-Oh! GBA champion. Information on the 2003 GBA World Championships is almost impossible to come by considering it was mostly covered as a side event and has almost no documentation. Despite this, there are a few things known about this event, some of which were posted on the classic metagame.com event coverage website, which stated that the video game tournament would occupy the top floor of the venue along with some extra practice dueling tables and the king of games section where an experienced player would take on newcomers of the game. These articles also mentioned that there were two female players in the nine finalists for the World GBA tournament and would require Konami to change the title of king of games to queen of games had they won the tournament. However, the winner of the very first video game tournament would be confirmed as the representative from France, Francois Ferry in a now-archived official Konami video which was re-uploaded by the user Yu-Gi-Oh! Shadow Kingdom. This would briefly feature footage and gameplay from the Game Boy Advance competition and culminated in footage of Francois winning the final match and eventually receiving his trophy on stage. Along with this, the top players were given some epic prize cards, Victory Dragon, Cannon the Sword Mistress, and Black Luster Soldier, which were printed in extremely limited amounts for that year. While I wasn't able to locate any footage of Francois playing, in order to see what kind of cards were in his deck, Francois would appear in the form of a French video game website, Jou Video, while discussing how to qualify for the 2007 Yu-Gi-Oh! Video Game Championships. This was mostly trash talking, but the user, Francois93000, would reveal that he was indeed the 2003 Worlds winner and would mention that he does have a copy of video cassettes capturing footage of the World Championships for that year. And while I couldn't find his username in use on any major social media platforms, this might give us some hope of learning more about this event in the future. While we didn't get as much coverage as I would have hoped, things would definitely start to pick up with the release of the new Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship Tournament 2004. This game had many similar features to Worldwide Edition, like the field layout design with the scrolling background, acquiring cards by selecting a pack after each win, and almost the same exact language selection menu. Most importantly though, it had almost all of the new cards up to the set, Pharaonic Guardian, and even more updated rulings compared to last year's game. But with an even better dual simulator, these games were still a little hard to get into competitively, considering you need to have the relatively new Game Boy Advance, buy the game as soon as you can and start unlocking stuff, and you'd also need reliable access to the internet in order to see where events are going to be held. However, after the 2003 Worlds event, 
the player base saw the opportunity of the World GBA Tournament as a new and easier way to potentially obtain extremely rare and valuable prize cards, which would give the GBA tournaments a substantial increase in attention from last year. This meant competition in the GBA events would begin to increase, and also around this time, Yu-Gi-Oh's partnership with at the time massive Toys R Us stores would give the player base a more centralized location for holding official qualifying tournaments at over 600 Toys R Us stores over the US. These qualifying tournaments would also follow a Duelist Kingdom style of rule set, where each player would begin with a certain amount of star chips, and each duel decide with their opponents how many chips to wager. This would go on for a few hours, with all the matches being carefully recorded and tracked by each player. After these tournaments had concluded, the 15 players with the most star chips would get invited to San Diego Comic Con that year to play out the USGBA National Championships, with the 16th slot being decided by a last chance qualifier that took place the day before. While the official rules for the Toys R Us tournaments are unknown, there is an archive copy of the last chance qualifier rules which gives us a pretty good idea of what playing in an old video game tournament was like. This specific rule set even had some really interesting rules such as at the end of the duel, the losing duelist has the option to check the deck of the winner if he or she thinks that the deck did not abide by the rules. This rule set also had provisions for things like batteries dying and link cable disconnections. With the last chance qualifier happening on Friday, the USGBA National Tournament would take place the next day on Saturday where the field would be cut down to a top four who would qualify for Sunday where they were joined by six players from Europe and two players from Japan to play out the Yu-Gi-Oh! GBA World Championships. And while the way the bracket played out is unknown, we would get confirmation of the top four placings with Patrick Dix coming in fourth, Junichi Natsume coming in third, and the finalists were Pere Torrea Saliete from Spain and Ryan Payton from the United States. Perry would end up taking the first game, but Ryan would come back and won the next two games in a row in order to clinch the GBA world title. The end of their match also made a brief appearance in that year's official Konami Worlds promo with Ryan Slate Warrior attacking directly for game. While we still didn't get a deck list this year, it's kind of safe to assume it was a pure beatdown deck, especially with a normal monster in play, and also the card pool lacked some of the best control cards in this era, such as the Chaos Boss Monsters and DD Warrior Lady, which was legal for the World's TCG Tournament. Just like Francois, Ryan would receive the same official prize cards given to the winner of the TCG Tournament, and this time, it was the prize of Ulevo for first place and a copy of Mateo the Matchlist for the top four placings. These cards are some of the rarest cards printed in all of Yu-Gi-Oh with unique effects that are similar to that of Victory Dragon, requiring three monster specific tributes and winning the entire match if that monster deals the final blow. On top of that, you got this extremely cool tablet trophy, which is pretty much never seen ever again. So with Yu-Gi-Oh! really starting to blossom as a franchise, 2005 would be a much better year for GBA competitions, getting more player participation and coverage than ever before. However, it wasn't all for the better because the release of the new world championship game, Yu-Gi-Oh! International 2, aka Seven Trials to Glory, would quickly be found out to be a notoriously buggy game which brought along many technical issues during gameplay. In short, this game took on some additional features, such as a map you could traverse, just like the sacred cards, and of course, include all the new cards and sets up to Invasion of Chaos. This was a pretty tall order, considering they really only have a year to make it, and this is done in a completely new style compared to their last game, but more on that later. There was also an interesting change about the way to qualify for Worlds this year, instead of having playoff tournaments where the players with the most star chips would continuously advance in the playoff tournaments, it switched to an even greater test of skill, a multiple choice quiz about the Yu-Gi-Oh trading card game where the top 100 scores would move on to the second round, another quiz about the Yu-Gi-Oh trading card game, and then of course the top 14 scores of those get invited to the national championships of their respective country. 
we actually got some really solid event coverage on the USGBA National Championship from a Pojo News article written by user TwinSend21. This featured a group picture of the 16 North American players in attendance and took place at Konami's official headquarters in Redwood, California on June the 11th. Among the 14 players who qualified through the quizzes, the last two slots were given to first and second place of last year's GBA National Championship, returning champion Patrick Dix, and runner-up Matthew Mancuso. These 16 players would play in a bracketed tournament along a table where the field would slowly be whittled down to a top four. Once it got to the tournament semifinals, the games would then be moved to a setup with dual game cubes and CRTs and a makeshift Konami wall shade preventing the players from screen looking off each other. With this sort of field, it was little surprise that last year's national champ, Patrick Dix, was pretty much farming wins with his Cyberstein Chaos hybrid deck and would defeat Raymond Lance's Warrior Swarm deck in the finals to claim his second USGBA national title and giving him another trip to Worlds. And while they're all smiles in this picture here, another Pojo user and attendee to the event, Sen Seeker, would testify that just the finals alone between Raymond and Patrick had two separate technical issues during the match, and a single game had to be replayed three times before they completed it without problems. The first reset was for a Cyber Stein activation where the life points were paid but no monster was special summoned, and the second reset was caused by a failed activation of DD Warrior Lady not removing the other monster from play, but more on that later. While the top 4 was simply played out for bragging rights, they would all receive a limited version of Firewing Pegasus, some random Yu-Gi-Oh merchandise, a copy of the new long-lasting Yu-Gi-Oh online game, and a trip to the GBA World Championships. And for this year, the World Championships would move away from the US and now take place in Tokyo, Japan about two months later on August the 6th. Thankfully, GBA received much more event coverage in the World promo and even gave us a look at the Japan GBA National Championship with all the players strung out along the floor, linked up and playing their respective matches. Instead of having one giant bracket like we did, Japanese nationals would follow a star chip style of tournament where after 90 minutes, a Ryozu Ikuta and Junichi Natsume came out on top of the crowd with Natsume making his third straight Yu-Gi-Oh! Worlds appearance. These two would join the other top 12 competitors and make up our Worlds GBA field for that year. Thankfully for this year, the website Kids World would post some excellent news coverage with a picture of the top 8 bracket where we would discover that a Chalkrone Sebastian, Brian Dunlap, Raymond Lance, and Tinsun Wong would tie for 5th through 8th place with Patrick Dix taking yet another 4th place finish at Worlds, followed up by Marco Chris from Germany who would take 3rd. But in true takeover fashion, the finalists this year were the two Japanese representatives, a 15-year-old Ryuzo and 22-year-old Junichi, who would of course play their set on the big stage right before TCG Finals. The finals match would also be briefly covered in that year's world promo, where Ryuzo would be seen triumphing over the three-time Japan rep. And while it does seem glamorous on the surface, there was of course a little bit of drama. A Japanese user with a blog on GeoCities would mention that the first game of the final match would end in a draw from a timely ring of destruction. The second match was, you guessed it, cancelled and had to be replayed due to an in-game error. And the third match would be finally won by Ryuzo, with the fourth match going to a timeout and the win also given to Ryuzo due to having more life points at the end of the time. The blog would also state that the same in-game errors that arose in Game 2 would happen to them at least two out of the six times they played the card during the qualifying tournaments. Capping off their coverage with seven trials to glory was a quote-unquote defective product. Regardless of the way it played out though, the winning deck by Ryuzo was noted by the GeoCities blog as a stall and burn deck with cards like Nightmare Wheel, Stealth Bird, and Mystic Tomato. Thankfully, Ryuzo's Game Boy winning deck list would be posted in that year's December issue of Shonen Jump, giving us a complete look at what he was cooking up. This build is actually a really unique build compared to a normal burn deck because some of the best cards in this era, Ojama Trio and Lava Golem, were not present in this game. 
So instead, the deck opts for more cards that can provide continuous advantage, such as Tsukoyomi and Mask of Darkness. We even got to see the full sideboard with the spicy tech of Chain Disappearance, and we also got to see Ryuzu's really interesting package of 3 Cyberstein and 3 Megamorph, which could catch plenty of decks off guard, and a consistent way to win just by pairing it with a single copy of Giant Trunade. While Stall isn't really a fan favorite by any means, it's way cooler than just another Chaos decklist, and it honestly seems like a pretty good metagame choice considering most of the Chaos decks were slower control style decks. This year's World Tournament would then be capped off with Yu-Gi-Oh! creator Kazuki Takahashi presenting the top 4 GBA competitors on stage and then giving them their prizes. This year's prizes would include some of the very elusive and brand new Victory Dragon S cards, King of Destruction XX, and Queen of Fate Eternia. Some more insanely awesome cards and definitely worth the effort for these competitors. Now before 2005 had ended, Nightmare Troubadour was released for the Nintendo DS, so it wasn't exactly a secret that the Game Boy Advance's lifespan was coming to an end. And in 2006, it was time for Konami to release its last Yu-Gi-Oh! GBA title with the absolute banger, Yu-Gi-Oh! Ultimate Masters World Championship Tournament 2006. This was by far the smoothest and most competent dual simulator ever released on the platform, with things like card thumbnails while they're in the field or in your hand, plus a much more pleasant deck editor being some of the biggest quality of life improvements. And after waiting for Comic-Con to come back to San Diego, Konami would have the top 16 players for 2006 meet there for the US GBA National Championship, where of course the top 4 players would receive an invite to Worlds that year. This again would follow an online quiz style of qualifiers, but with the player base starting to understand the quiz metagame, the tryhards would store every bit of Yu-Gi-Oh information they found in the world and came prepared with notes and sources leading to a stronger nationals field. All the players then met up at Konami's booth in a roped off area where all the players would flop out their link cables on the table and face off in a single elimination bracket where the top 4 players would get invited to worlds. And some additional tech that I forgot to mention in this game is that it has a naming system that allows you to display your name and your deck name right before you duel. And often, players would name their deck to something else. So for instance, if you were running a Final Countdown deck, you could change it to something funny like Cyberstein OTK for a little bit of mind games. And that's exactly what Jason Bunch did at Nationals while talking about his tournament experience on a post on Pojo. He would go on to say he played a gadget deck in the first round, which he was able to stall his way through, and then ran into gadgets again in round two, where he would narrowly lose his slot to worlds by losing the turn the countdown was supposed to win the match. The gadget player who beat him, Patrick Lewis, would go on to take second place at the Nationals event, with Jason Lee coming in first, Michael Hott in third, and Brandon Sherman in fourth, which was the only other deck known at this event, and noted to be playing a Cyberstein OTK deck. These four players would then fly out to Japan just two weeks later where the 2006 Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship would take place. This world's event was mostly a mystery until the actual legend and Giga Chad lookalike, Brandon Sherman, who goes by Shermstats on Twitter, came forward to bless us with some exclusive photos of the event. Brandon, who placed 4th at US Nationals, attended Worlds and was able to give us a photo of the 12 players in attendance that year, each with their respective region as well. These players would play a few rounds before cutting the field to a top 8, where Christian Gilberti and Kenji Watanabe would triumph over their sides of the bracket and meet in the finals which, as usual, played in front of the crowd on the large projectors behind them. While I wasn't able to locate any relevant footage of the 2006 World Championship, a Japanese blogger posted about their experience with some brief coverage of GBA Finals, and when I say brief, that is not by choice, because the first match began with Gilberti summoning a Mystic Tomato and setting one face down card. And on the second turn, Kenji starts and plays a bunch of cards in his hand, combos off into a reversal quiz, and wins the game that turn. You know, okay, that's fine. No big deal. Christian's gonna go first again, Christian sets a monster in defense, sets one face down card, and Kenji dropped his whole hand again and wins the game on the second turn, leaving the crowd absolutely stunned. 
This was a pretty awesome way for the finals to end, considering this was a super unique deck and obviously very strong in this game. While Christian's deck is mostly a mystery, considering nobody saw anything besides a Mystic Tomato, Kenji's deck would thankfully be posted in an issue of Shonen Jump, where a Japanese blogger would eventually post it on their website, giving us another full look at the GBA Champion deck. From this post, we know that the deck wins by assembling a 3 card combo of Agent of Creation Venus, Reversal Quiz, and either Black Pendant or Fuma Shuriken. Once you get the Venus in play, you can pay your life points down to 500 and then simply set one of the equip spells, activate reversal quiz which will switch life points to your opponent and destroy every card on your field in the process, activating those burn cards and depleting your opponent's life points right after the reversal quiz resolves. Judging from the build, the engine is very similar to other decks like Demok Mass Driver FTK or even a Magical Explosion FTK which utilize cards like Monster Gate and Reasoning to dump a bunch of cards into the graveyard and then use cards like Spell Reproduction or Excavation of Magical Stones in order to add those combo pieces back into your hand. For his efforts, Kenji would go on to receive the new, very limited Victory Dragon clone, Aramant of the Lethal Gods for getting first, and also a Testament of the Arcane Lords which was given to the top 4. This event capped off Konami's slightly rocky but still very wonderful 4 year esport journey on the Game Boy Advance. These tournaments would also pave the way for the next generation of World Championship Tournament games releasing on the successor platform the Nintendo DS, where we'd finally break away from the restraints of the link cables allowing us to duel wirelessly. And if you want to hear about all that, be sure to subscribe so we can go on another wonderful journey of our classic card game. This became a fairly massive research project, so I'd like to personally thank Brandon, who is a really nice guy and helped me out a ton, so please go show him some love for keeping the GBA alive. I'm going right back into the lab to conjure up some more Yu-Gi-Oh! video game content, so be sure to let me know your favorite game so that we can compare digital waifus.